One of the good things about follicular lymphoma is that with modern therapy, outcomes have steadily improved. And so that for most patients diagnosed with follicular lymphoma today, their expected survival is not very different from age-matched controls. However, there is a group of patients who do very, very poorly. About one in five patients with follicular lymphoma will progress within the first 24 months after their initial therapy, and their long-term survival is poor with about a 30% five-year overall survival. Um, so I, obviously, we're not selecting the right treatment for this biologically aggressive group of patients. Um, and uh, in a perfect world, would we be able to figure out who they are before we ever give them treatment so we can try novel treatments and develop new approaches for these patients? The M7 Flippy, which um, was uh, developed as an international effort, but largely uh, led by David Weinstock and Oliver Weigert, um, was an attempt to approve, approve upon the clinical prognostic factors called the FLIPI, which are very easy uh, clinical factors that we use all the time, but it, it defines a group of high-risk patients, many of whom are not very high risk. And uh, what the M7 FLIPI was, was a, an addition of molecular information from DNA sequencing, which identified a series of genes um, some of which, when mutated, were prognostically favorable. Other genes, when mutated, were unfavorable. And uh, the M7 Flippy takes the presence or absence of this, these mutations in a weighted way and adds it to the Flippy to find a model that's really much more predictive. Because what happens is it identifies many of those high-risk patients as really having low risk. Um, and so now we identify a group of high-risk patients that um, uh, really does have a relatively poor outcome. So the big question in this study was, what was the relationship between the high-risk patients from the M7 Flippy and those patients who were destined to progress within the first 24 months? Because if there was a very high correlation between them, then we would have a way before treatment ever started of identifying them. Well, there's no question that the M7 Flippy is dramatically enriched for these poor risk uh, patients. So, but if you ask how many patients are destined to progress early, by the M7 Flippy, half progress early and half are predicted to not progress early. They're in the lower risk group of the M7 Flippy. Um, but if we look, there's about a 5.8-fold enhancement enrichment for these very poor prognostic patients. So yes, we can use the M7 Flippy, but it doesn't perfectly define all of the patients we would like to find. It might uh, be that uh, some mild tweaking of the uh, M7 Flippy uh, would uh, allow us to achieve that, or we might need to find additional genes that really define that poor risk group. But what it shows us is that the M7 Flippy is a powerful tool. Um, it can predict for these early progressors, uh, but we just need to make this a little bit better. So I think the next steps are two. One is, you know, whenever you create a model, you create a model around a question. And the question was, can we identify patients, you know, in general, how they're going to do? But it was, it was a continuous variable. Um, and the time element wasn't dichotomized. Um, if you, in fact, include the dichotomization, it might actually be a stronger predictor. Um, and that's, you know, for statisticians to play with and to see if it makes it a better predictor. Um, what many groups, including our own, is, are looking at are we're trying to do very deep sequencing of these early progressors and ask, are there common genes that are mutated uh, that really help further identify this uh, early progressing group, and they would then be added 
to the M7 Flippy and they might be the M9 Flippy or the M15 Flippy um, and then hopefully better identify that early progressing group.